Welcome to uh, the very imaginatively titled Broadcaster Panel. We couldn't come up with anything better than that, but it does what it says on the tin. We've got four great uh, and very prominent broadcasters with us today. Um, I'm just going to start off by giving a, a brief uh, bio on each of our guests here. Um, to my right is Cheryl Taylor. Cheryl is controller of the BBC's dedicated channel for 6 to 12 year old children, CB CBBC, and is responsible for over 4,000 hours of programming a year. She commissions all CBBC content for television and online, including factual drama, comedy, entertainment, and news, as well as a wide range of interactive content, including games and apps. Um, beside Cheryl is uh, Sheila de Corsi, who has spent over 30 years in the industry. She's worked across multiple genres, including documentary, drama, current affairs, and music. And since 2004, Sheila has been heading up RT's Young People's uh, Department and oversees content, content for children and youth up to age 18. Uh, over from America is Tara Sorensen. Uh, she's head of kids programming for Amazon Studios, overseeing development and production of original kids series. And during her time, she has shepherded numerous Amazon original kids series, including the award-winning Tumble Leaf, and is currently working with uh, Ireland's newest studio, Lighthouse uh, mm -hmm. Pictures on <laughs> Keep the Cat. Is that right? Uh, on Bug Diaries. Sorry, Bug Diaries. I'm and sorry about that. Saloon, Keep the Cat. Um, prior to Amazon, uh, Tara enjoyed a number of senior positions at National Geographic, Sony Pictures, and Nelvana. And finally, uh, and most importantly, Sarah Muller. <laughs> Sarah is the uh, recently appointed head of children's at Channel 5 in the UK, responsible for commissioning and acquisition of children's programming for Channel 5's digital and linear platforms. Sarah oversees the channel's popular programming strand, Milkshake, um, and prior to her very new job, she had a long stint uh, with Cheryl at CBBC, where her animation credits included Danger Mouse and Strange Hill High. So uh, if you could just give them a, a warm welcome. So kind of uh, picking up on the theme uh, that has run through the day, um, uh, and Russell touched on it brilliantly as well, I wanted to, uh, you know, for, for our, our student contingent, is, is sort of get an idea of how you came to do what you do now. And I just wanted to start it off and, and take you back to when you were six years old and ask you what, what you wanted to be when you grew up. Cheryl. Uh, comedy actress. I always loved sitcoms and anything funny. Um, so in my, my very early years, I was... Um, determined that I would be either a theatrical or TV actress. Um, eventually ended up at Bristol University doing a drama degree where there were people who really, really wanted to be actors and actresses and I realised that I came a poor second, so moved into production instead. Next best thing. But you did end up in, uh, you headed up comedy for some time at, at BBC. Yeah. Which, a fantastic job. What, what made you... Make, make the jump over to children's television? Um, partly location, if I'm honest, because the brilliant children's department had moved up nearer to where I lived in Manchester. Um, and it was one of those things where someone said, oh, you, you should have a think about CBBC. Um, and I started watching the content and having thought, oh, maybe I thought, oh, wow, this is an amazing channel. You know, you can do anything on this channel, um, and it's such a brilliant audience as well. So at that point, I started to really, really want that job, um, because I realised in, in terms of drama, and in particular comedy, um, and I know a lot of the, the young students here today won't necessarily watch CBBC, but um, both in drama, the animation, and, and the comedy, um, you can do stuff on that channel that, that no one else is doing on any other channel, and in particular, even the BBC grown-up channels. So it's, a, so it's a proper playground, and um, probably, I'd say, the most fertile environment for creative people, writers and designers and um, imaginators um, anywhere in the world. It's extraordinary. So very lucky. Good. Sheila, what did you dream of when you were a little girl? It's Cass. I, I, I wanted to be a mum. 
That's what I wanted to be when I was a little girl. I didn't, I, I, you know, so, so as I kind of evolved then, maybe when I was seven or something, I, it basically came down to, I love work, I, love, I have always loved music, I love the outdoors, I love drawing, and I like nice people, and I like people who love what they do. So as it kind of evolved during my childhood, I always wanted to be with people who had a lot of energy, you know, who, who just loved what they did, so that it, you actually had a really engaged conversation all the time. And people who sort of got stuck into the world and, and just forged forward, you know? And that, taking all those interests together was uh, essentially how I ended up in film. I mean, this is a long time ago, so it was, you know, in, in the days of Super 8. Um, I, I was also interested in storytelling, so I, I did an archaeology in college, but I also was sort of designing set designing and designing interiors of shops and all that kind of thing. And I used to draw and I used to make clothes and I used to design fabrics and I used to sell them on the street and I used to be a busker. So it was all of those different things that gradually kind of ended up working in the National Museum. I designed exhibitions. And then I saw an ad for television. I didn't watch television, but it, it all came together. So for me, it's never actually been, I, I never wanted to be anything apart from being a mum. And I'm very glad to say I am a mum, but I never wanted to be anything else it was more, I have always wanted to work on projects also with minority audiences, so marginalised groups, working together with music, images, sound, stories, with people who love what they do and who are kind of fundamentally optimistic about the world. Um, and then gradually, so I got, I got into television, I worked as a production assistant, I, I made documentaries, I directed drama, I made current affairs, I did general elections, I did all of those kind of things, you know, you're shooting all over the world or whatever. And gradually, as television, as television broadly speaking, became more commercialised from my end, or commodified, I became more interested in where are the spaces that there are where people are making content that actually still means something. And I had worked in the arts for quite a long time. And one of the areas, I got a commission to, do, to develop a teen soap opera. And I worked for a year on that. And I, I, I realised that in kids' programming that everybody left me alone. It's a bit like Irish language programming. Lots of you here are you know, Irish. But in those days, none of the people commissioning understood Irish. So I used to make all these programmes in Irish that nobody understood. <laughs> so you had complete freedom to make what you wanted, you know? And it's a way like that in kids. I mean, only everybody here loves kids' programmes. But a lot, you know, the feedback that we often get from our, our you know, other sections of our broadcasters isn't enormous, I think I'm fair in saying. So it's kind of one of those areas where you think it's like a hidden area full of people who love what they do. And that's, that's how I've ended up. It's interesting, because it just struck me that women do make good uh, broadcast executives because when you talk about being a mum, dads tend to watch their kids watch it. Can I watch The Walking Dead? Yeah, sure, or whatever. But <laughs> mums tend to uh, be more responsible in their choices for children, so that, that's a good one. Tara, how about you? I didn't know what I wanted to be when I was six years old. In fact, I didn't know what I wanted to be when I was 18 or, or 20, for that matter. So um, I was an English major in school, initially was a business major, and I knew I did not want to do that. I think my parents always encouraged me to find something that I loved, because it wouldn't be then a job, it would be a passion. So um, when I got out of school, I, I pursued companies I was interested in, things I was interested in, and found myself uh, working at the children's television workshop on a couple of kids' magazines, Kid City Magazine and Ghost, Ghost Writer. Um, when I moved back to California, because I loved the weather, um, there wasn't any kids publishing, and so the next natural progression for me was kids' television. Um, at, at Ghost Writer and Kid City Magazine, I was reviewing products of animated series, and so I essentially sent out resumes to a bunch of companies and then landed at Nelvana, um, and have always been in the, the kids' business, mostly on the independent production side since that point. I guess until now, as a, at Amazon Studios, acting more as a producer and the network. Great. And Sarah? I showed my children Kill Bill when they were six. They turned out very well. <laughs> True. Um, OK, I actually wanted to be a vet or an animal rescue worker. That would have been hopeless, because I don't deal with suffering terribly well, and I would have just been upset and hopeless all the time. <laughs> Moving on from that, I came from an entirely medical family, and the plan was I would just go into the family business. And I actually had a place at medical school, and it went right to the wire. And then there was a massive family argument, and I stomped off to drama school to show I had um, <laughs> an independent streak. But I didn't want to act. It was always production and design that interested me. And I went into theatre, and I was living in some kind of communal housing 
project in East London. And I began to realize that most people didn't go to the theater, that it wasn't egalitarian media, and that what I was doing was quite elitist and exclusive. And I was really quite right on then, so I didn't want to do that. Um, and Boris from the Black Stuff had literally just come out and everybody liked it. It didn't matter who you were or where you came from, everybody had a way into it or could see something in it they enjoyed. So I decided I'd get into television. And then a really long time went by. Anyway, so I was working in adult drama and comedy, which I was very happy with and thought I'd stay there. But the company I was working with, uh, one of the creator, creators of the company had written a book called Grizzly Tales for Gruesome Kids. And Carlton acquired the rights, and Honeycomb Animation were going to make it. And we said, no, no, hang on. If anyone's making it, we'll make it. So then we were in the kids' business and animation at that when we'd never done any. And I loved everything about this side of the business so much, particularly as I've had a lot of experience, as has Cheryl and the other parts, and what people are like. It was a real joy to be with passionate people who aren't in it for glory or money because they enjoy reaching the audience and telling the kind of stories but also dealing with an audience that are courageous and don't have any boundaries set, so you can just try more stuff out. So, you know, it's really, it's a passion thing for me, children. I didn't intend to be here, but I love it and I'm staying. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I'll stay with you, Sarah, for a minute, because, I mean, you're known as a, a very collaborative um, TV executive, and I, and I think, you know, part of what we want to achieve with, with this session and the sessions throughout the, the couple of days is, to sort of let everybody know that it's not producer and broadcaster and they're sort of always fighting. Of course, there's, there's disagreements, but maybe Sarah, um, talk, talk a little bit about, I mean, having been on the production side as, com as compared to the broadcast side and, and just talk about how, 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 what the differences are for you. Do you want me to talk about the differences or about how it should all work and why it's a great thing? What would you prefer? Well, it sounds like you want to talk about the latter. That's what I'm talking about. <laughs> uh, everybody, every component part of any production wants it to be the very best that it can be. No one in this room has gone into or wants to go into this business because they want to make something that's sort of all right. Mm. Just get by, whatever it is. We all want to make great stuff. And that's what you have to keep reminding yourself. You know, square your shoulders, look yourself in the eye and say, everybody wants it to be good. So you may not agree necessarily with some of the notes. You might think that people are unqualified to be giving you the kind of comments and feedback that they are. But you have to take it in the spirit with which it's, in, it's intended and address it. And sometimes they may be right and you should be willing to have that argument. And sometimes they'll be wrong and they should be willing to listen to you and you can find a compromise. But you just have to remember that once we've got to the stage where we're actually all making something together, we should be able to enjoy that and work together. And everybody wants the same thing. So broadcasters aren't the enemy, investors aren't the enemy, all work together. <laughs> That's broadcasters plotting, I would, I would say. It's not always like that. Um, it is when you work with us. Yeah, but it is with these people. Um, so I, I just want to segue into just a little bit more detail about your specific positions, because I think sometimes corporate titles can be you know, somewhat impenetrable uh, for people out there. So Cheryl, tell us, what, when you get into work in the morning, wh wh what are you doing? What, what's your main role in the organization? Usually I'm hoping that the Daily Mail aren't trying to print a negative story about the BBC. <laughs> but um, I have a really um, lovely job because um, in terms of the, the number of genres that CBBC encompasses, whether that's, as you said at the beginning, kind of factual, animation, drama, entertainment, um, I kind of sit across all of it, so I commission essentially all the content that goes out on the channel. However, I have a team of extraordinarily creative and passionate people and execs who work with me. So in this room, I can see her at the back there, is Dame Jacqueline Edwards, um, who looks after both the animation for CBBC and CBeebies. So anyone in this room or any indie um, who kind of has a great idea would kind of come through Jackie first um, and we would discuss it and take it from there. So it's, um, it's a really <laughs> wide ranging job, um, but ultimately I suppose the buck stops with me. So if we make bad decisions, I'm the person who has to take responsible, responsibility for that. Um, but at the same time, of course, it enables me to meet 
a vast number of very creative and wonderful people. And, and just before you move on to Sheila, who's not very collaborative, by the way. Um, <laughs> she is, she's the most collaborative person. Just in terms of what Sarah was saying, all I would add about that, I think, I think that's true. Once you have a commission, you are kind of in it together. However, in terms of future relationships, there is no doubt that sometimes I think, you know, you've got one person thinking this and another person thinking this. And as the French say, ça fait deux. So, you know, you are allowed next time round to think, I don't get on with this person and life is too short to go another round on a project with people who you're always knocking heads with. So choose your partners wisely. Choose them wisely because it is tricky. Animation relies on the most collaborative relationships, I think, of any other genre. You're in it for the long term. It's really intensive. It's really expensive. So, so make friends with people and um, hold their hand through that journey. Yeah, it is especially true in animation. You know, a, a live action series can be you know shot in six weeks and, and, and finished in three or four months. Where as we're we're talking about Years. you know on average a two year yeah. stint mm. for a for a television show, an animated television show. Yeah. Sheila, do you want to talk a little bit about what, what you do uh, at RTE? Mind, so my, I've got two titles that are absolutely fit into that sort of gobbledygook thing. One is group head of children's or tea group head of children's, and basically what I am as that is I um, advise on strategies and, and sort of take leadership in relation to. Um, what RT does with children in a range of different formats. But then I'm also in charge of all of our content across four platforms, online, mobile, digital, and uh, radio and television um, for sort of 17 and under. And then I'm also controller of RT Junior, which is our uh, cross-platform under sevens sort of output. So I am in charge of all of that as well. So essentially what I do is I commission, I do long-term strategy, I sign off and everything. Like Cheryl, I'm, I take responsibility, ultimate responsibility for everything that goes out. And then I also look at long-term plans. So I will be looking at a year in advance. This is where we've got a gap. This is where we want to work in. Have you explored this option? You know, I'm looking at long-term vision, whereas we've got two fantastic people likewise, Polly McNamara, who's um, executive producer in charge of animation, and you will, you will get to know her, and uh, live action and animation. And then Stephen Plunkett has just come on as a live action executive producer. And they both, uh, commission and are involved in the direct commissions um, of, of content. And just one other, in relation to that collaboration point, because I think another thing to add to that is every conversation you have with somebody can be very useful. Every single, a hello, you're standing, somebody says, I don't like the way you do that, or I do like that. It's something to remember all the time. Every time I talk to somebody, like, you know, about a project, or they show me something, or like seeing the bread run, it's really interesting. And the one recommendation that I give to people is, always think about your own process in relation to what you hear. So you never sit still. All the time you're thinking, is that the right way to take this forward? Or am I making the right choices? Or gosh, if I put in that flower there, you know, they're very little things or very big things, but I think it's always to keep your, yourself thinking constantly, interrogating your own process, your own thinking, your own attitudes, the way you see the world, you know, in collaboration with other people. That, that's really valuable for moving your own thinking forward, you know, and for being able to hear what other people say to you. So that's my speak. Tara, I mean, uh, Amazon, I, I'd, love to, I'd love to hear you talk a little bit about the organization, how it works, because, I mean, you know, Amazon is what we've been calling a, a disruptor in the industry, although now it's become, you know, kind of mainstream. But tell us what you do, but also maybe talk a little bit about what makes you different from a traditional platform yeah. broadcaster. Um, well, I oversee development for all of kids' programming, preschool, transitional preschool, 6 to 11, both animation and live action. Um, you know, ultimately, I think I'm responsible for developing a brand for what we want our content of originals to be for kids and families. So I have a, a great team, and they're managing the day-to-day -day development of you know those the different demos that I spoke of. Um, and ultimately, I'm trying to think sort of ahead, you know, three to five years on how we evolve, um, where our holes are, um, you know, and essentially, I'm, I'm putting out fire day to day so my team can focus sort of on the creative collaborations with, you know, producers and wonderful studios. Um, in terms of how, what I think Amazon is or becoming, I, 
You know, I think Jeff sort of founded the company um, as a technology company first and foremost, um, but he encourages us to be experimental and innovative. So what I'm trying to think about is how I don't um, repeat ourselves, um, how as a content provider, you know, my role, I think, in, in all of this is to make sure that our programs have impact on the audience, you know, why are we doing them? It's sort of a big question that I'm constantly asking myself and pushing my executives to, to do the same. Um, you know, I think people assume as Amazon has retail roots that we're going to be focused on consumer products and that's not our MO. Our goal, again, is really to think about stories and characters and how we can tell, you know, those in a different way that hasn't already been done. Yeah, I just want to dig in a, a little bit more there. Yeah. Uh, in the differences I see it. I mean, uh, everyone else here, I mean, Sheila's looking after the interests of Irish children, Sarah and Cheryl are, are looking after the interests of British children, whereas Amazon has a global footprint. Right. And how does that impact the kind of decisions you're, you're making? I mean, as an independent producer, and for the most part of my career, I've been on the independent side. Um, you know, when I was with Nelvana, we didn't have a channel. When I was with Sony, we didn't have a channel. And I think I always approach creative from an international perspective. So many of us have to, you know, create that patchwork quilt of financing, especially as they're talking about breadwinners and 18 different financing partners. So, you know, we're always thinking about how these programs can travel the globe. You know, for, for me, um, it's just not um, a matter of financing. Again, it's a matter of impact and how these programs sort of can have legs in different countries and resonate with you know, kids of all shapes, sizes, colors, et cetera. Um, so it hasn't really changed the way I think we do business. You know, certainly from a live action perspective, um, I think you know, that becomes more difficult to challenge as you're trying to take those programs around the globe. But animation, I think, is a little bit more timeless and classic. And it's a kind of global business anyway. I mean, most of the producers out there, I mean, the model has changed. It used to be, a, you know, you got your commissioning broadcaster who pretty much covered your whole budget. Right. That hasn't been the case in a long, long time. So producers are looking to stitch together that, right. those global models markets anyway and, and making sure that Cheryl's needs are addressed as well as you know right. an Australian public broadcaster um, so Sarah I mean you you've very recently made the move over to five um, and I just wanted to apart from what you do in there and, and and your sort of vision for the channel maybe talk a little bit about you know having experienced the public broadcasting side and now going over to the private sector you know what the differences are for you well it's still public sector Technically. So I still like to approach the audience in the way that I did when I was at the BBC, albeit I'm now working for, towards a preschool audience. That's my main focus, whereas I was working with Cheryl for the older age group at the BBC. Um, the difference I notice is an approach from the company around me, not Viacom and Nickelodeon, but Channel 5's approach to the content and monetizing it and having a slightly different an ambiguous relationship with it, um, in a good way. Uh, but that's fine. Everybody, it, we're in business. We're all in business, even if it's public service. So we do have to think of ways that we are going to exploit that. I'm not sure I'm articulating this terribly well. I will get there. Um, so that doesn't change the business of creating and providing excellent and best content of never stopping the search for the best, newest creative talent, and then making sure that you are future-proofed as far as the audience and where they are is concerned. And that will always continue to be the business of television for me. Or of content, let's not even say television anymore, hey. Um, it, things are diversifying quicker and faster than any of us had expected. So the one remaining constant, which everybody said here, which is very encouraging, is, the one thing that defines a platform is the great thing that you go to to watch there. So that's what we're all looking out for, and that's what I will continue to do at Milkshake. And I'll be looking to try and bring some new writers in, some new creators, and, and bring some of the things and cross-pollinate from the BBC experience to the Channel 5 one. Great. I, I'm going to stick with you for a minute, Sarah, okay. because uh, you know we're, we're, we're continuing to talk about breaking down the barriers. And I remember you know when I was doing a media course in Dublin, and you know, 
the jobs were to be found at RT. We knew our, RT was our outlet, but we were all sort of, well, I don't know anyone at RTE. I mean, how do I, how do I approach you know, somebody at an organization like that. So Sarah, talk about, you know, how, how do these kids here come to you and, and present an idea? Okay, well, everybody's got a different way that they like to work. I think for me, because I used to be in your position and I did start life as a producer who wanted to present to broadcasters and investors, the answer is it lies with you. I think I'm willing to take a pitch as big, as small, as under or overdeveloped as you feel you need it to be for you to communicate your vision. Uh, Rebecca Hobbs talked brilliantly about this earlier, the passion. Communicate the passion. So that could be pages and pages and a full script and an animation test if you want, but it can also be the germ of an idea that's something, a story you've always wanted to tell. Um, it's horses for courses. Uh, we have no right as broadcasters to sit here and say we expect you to shoulder the burden of development and we expect to see things at a certain level because you might not have the resources to do that. So we're very happy. Bring it on. If you want to show us something, we will look and we will always look. I think all of us can say that. We all consider everything and try to be as timely as we can about it as well because, again, we all know what it's like to wait to a reply. <laughs> Tara, I mean, I, what, what I find interesting about a modern company like Amazon is that if you, you know, if you're buying a pair of slippers for your granny on Amazon, you can also sort of surf through there and find a, an online application form that basically, you know, if you've written a script or you have an idea for a script, you can just attach it and click it and send it. Is, yeah. is it really that simple at Amazon? Uh, I mean, it is. So, and we've optioned uh, multiple, you know, concepts from our online portal. We've also produced series. Um, Gordimer Gibbons came out of that system. Our feature group is producing something um, called The Wall with Doug Lyman attached to produce, which came in as an online submission. Um, so certainly that is open to everyone. And then similarly, you know, people can send us their concepts. Um, if you can find us, you know, we will read it. And, uh, you know, I think that the thing that we are looking for is um, something, a unique perspective, a unique voice. You know, we certainly all hear hundreds of pitches in a week, um, sometimes more if you're at a market. Um, but we want to we want to see something that stands out. We want to understand that the you know creator understands the pitch themselves, and it's not just regurgitating you know an idea. Great. I mean, I, and you know, I think something to sort of impart on everybody is that uh, people in broadcast positions can receive hundreds upon hundreds of ideas a year, you know, 700, 800 ideas a year. Um, Sheila, what, you know, how do we approach you and how, how do we sort of break through all that noise? What, what, what's going to stand out for you? I think, it, okay, so there's a couple of different things. We have a short scheme, which we have an annual, an annual short scheme where we commission five, five kind of two-minute shorts, and they can be used as a sort of core development for another project. That's the first thing. The second thing is we have um, uh, on the website, there's an RT commissioning website, and it's worth you know, familiarising yourself with that. And through that, you can submit ideas, and they will all be assessed. Um, then we also go to markets generally and, and, you know, various different markets and whatever and meet people at those, like, you know, wherever we can in that thing. The main thing that I would say from our, our end, and this is really important, we don't have the money that some of the other broadcasters have. So we would tend to be a licensor and they will need to, the idea will need to have legs where it will be bringing funding from other areas. So unfortunately, it would be lovely to think that we could commission beautiful ideas on our own. We can't. We actually are a very small part of an overall Thing. What we can do is we can work with companies to give them guidelines. Like we can work with individuals or companies to give them guidelines as to how this might develop or production companies they might go to. From our end, it's much better if they come with a production company because the investment animation series are so expensive that actually somebody's got experience and a track record in making something is very useful if they come to us because they know what's involved in making it. And that's not to run anybody down. It just is literally to get that experience before you put your one pager down. But we do have do look up the RT commissioning um, website. The final thing that I'd say is in virtually everything that we invest any money in, we're looking for something that will have some resonance. Our, our core mission is to explore and reflect the world in which young people in Ireland are growing up. And so what we try to do is to, within our schedules, our, our two different you know, uh, channels, we try to have a reflection of where kids are 
who are growing up in Ireland where they are in their world in the midst of all of our acquisitions. We've got a lot of acquisitions, but the Irish money that we spend is to give it some Irishness. So we tend to move towards it, maybe an Irish accent, it may be you know, an Irish element to it, but that would tend to be our, you know, an element of something that we would be looking for rather than a Euro pudding which is, you know, everybody a little bit of this and a little bit of that. And they're actually, and the final thing, and I think one of you mentioned it is, we like something that somebody feels really strongly about. Something that somebody, because normally an animation will only get made if somebody is passionate about their idea, that they believe that this is, they've worked at it and they think this will work. And it, it's not, we don't buy, you know, it's not buying sausages. It's actually taking a brilliant idea and actually working with that, investing that to take it further. Mm -hmm. So I suppose they're the things we're looking for. Yeah, and I'm going I'm to jump ahead a little bit, Cheryl, and jump I'm just going to give out your email address to everybody. <laughs> you, but, no, I, you know, given what Sheila just said about, you know, Ireland is a small market and it's challenged by its size in terms of, uh, you know, the, the amount of money that's available to invest in animated content. And I think we sometimes sort of treat the UK as our sort of, you know, our domestic partner. And obviously there's a huge investment by uh, the BBC and other um, British and, and uh, American channels in Ireland. Mm. Two-part question, what do you like about working with Irish studios and uh, how is Brexit, which I think is being voted or is going, the article's going to be enacted this week, next week? Next Wednesday. Do you see that changing for you at the BBC? Um, to answer your first, um, past question first, um, it's really interesting coming, coming here to Dingle because, of course, it's focused my mind on how many Irish partners we work with. And um, it's fascinating for me as well, coming from a comedy background, one of the, the main things running through all of the projects that we do in Ireland is, is humour. So we do Danger Mouse out here, which is, a, as you know, I mean, it's a, it's a heritage brand, but um, completely hilarious. We work with Kite on Brain Freeze, which is a really great science show, but with humour shot through it. Roy we do with Jam, which is, again, a very humorous sitcom. Um, and we do a, a couple of live action things over here as well, uh, Secret Life of Boys and Millie in Between. So what I find fascinating about that is that all the people we work with we love. They are collaborative, and we underlined how important them, that collaboration is. But also they're highly creative. So I think the communities here are highly dedicated, highly creative, um, and they make great partners, both, I think, for animation and for live action, and, and for me, bang, um, <laughs> humour. Humour is, um, is one of the key things. So um, to your Brexit question, um, from my point of view, it's too early to say. I don't think anybody really knows about how, for example, location-specific subsidies and grants might be affected by the EU. Um, we'll have to see. But my feeling is that given the long tradition of really fantastic and valuable and audience-pleasing relationships that we've had in the past, that that will continue. I can't see it stopping. Here, here, yeah. Um, Tara, what, what, what makes you want to come to Ireland to, to find content? Uh, I mean, we're working with four studios right now on multiple series, so I think, you know, as Cheryl said, it's, it's, there's certainly a, a high level of creativity here, but I think the other piece of it is, you know, every studio that I've visited, um, there are artists there that really um, believe in the medium, um, that continue to sort of push past boundaries and elevate the medium, so they're delivering to the highest of standards. Um, you know, a lot of the studios, I think, function like a family, um, which makes it really unique for me. Um, I remember the first time I visited Brown Bag and I was just really blown away by how they all interacted with one another. Um, they cared and respected um, one another. They, I think, pushed, pe they, they pushed their family members to, again, sort of deliver to a higher standard. Um, and they all support one another. And I think that's pretty consistent with, with all the studios that we're working with right now. So, um, and how, how could you argue with being here on this beautiful, sunny, yeah, <laughs> sunny day in yeah, Dingle? <laughs> no, I mean, I think, you know, having, having worked in Canadian television now for 20 years, uh, you know, Ireland is another great example where public policy 
can create that fertile ground for creativity to happen. And, and you know, uh, smaller markets like Canada and Ireland really need that, and, and long may it continue. We, I mean, we constantly are talking about, you know, the kids' businesses and how kids' television is different than adult programming. Um, I, I think there's a, a sophistication for what we do, and everyone here believes in the power of the medium. Um, it really is an art form, and I think you see that in The Breadwinner. I think you see that in all the programs that come out of this country. Um, and it's why I think Amazon has been, um, you know, visiting Ireland quite often mm -hmm. to discover new talent. Yeah, um, as I predicted, we've, we've run out of time and we haven't covered half of the, the topics that we'd, we'd like to have, but I mean, we could have talked for ages, but I, I do want to make sure that we, we open up to the floor for a few questions before we finish. So if there's anyone uh, who has a question for someone up here, you won't get to see these people very often, so if you have a question, ask it now. We've left them speechless. <laughs> wow, that must be really I'm comprehensive. But who's going to be brave? Who's going so to be brave? They're we intimidated like. by four women. Yeah, yeah so right. I'll ask you a question. What, what's the, your favorite show that you don't have on your network, Sarah? Either Steven Universe or Archer, and they're never going to be on my network, are they? Really, realistically. Tara. Oh, gosh. That's such a tough question. Um, that I want on my network that I don't have on my network. I have a great show. I'm going to pitch you after. <laughs> 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 you I love Little time. Lunch. I just think, I mean, it's a live action show. I probably should have chosen something animated. Um, but it's, I thought it was so fresh and so different, distinct. Sheila? I, I suppose I, I'm, I'm collaborative to the extent that I don't think about my station. I actually think that all, you know, in the kids' mm. world, that it's a very neutral, like content is very neutral. The area that I think that we don't have, that we collectively don't have, um, the two areas that are challenged for young children is drama, like real social drama that actually explores what it's like to be a kid, but in a way that kids can, that's very hard to do. You see sometimes it's in Scandinavia. And so that's one area that I'd love to see, you know, real social drama, but, but done in a way with humor, with, you know, with, in a kid's way. And the second one is current affairs. The world is in such an unusual, we are in an unusual time. And particularly given the, how media has developed over the last 10 years, you know, how the kind of social media, all of that, which is very different to when I was a child. And I, I would love to see some some way of us, us collectively, all of us, interpreting or reinterpreting, you know, the way the world is for young children in a way that they can understand and that actually gives them hope. Because without hope, we've got nothing. Cheryl, um, I love Bob's Burgers, and um, I think <laughs> it's um, obviously it's a highly comedic show, and it's really tricky on CBBC because our what we call our service license, which sounds a bit dry, but um, is for six to twelves. So everything that, that we commission, to some degree, has to be a broad appeal. And I, there's so much of, of Bob's Burgers that I know that the 9, 10, 11 year olds would absolutely love. But then obviously, as you know, it tips into a couple of areas where it's a bit excoriating. And obviously I enjoy it, but I think the parents of the six, seven, eight year olds could get a bit arsy about it. But um, <laughs> I, love, I love the casting. I, I think that's so imaginative. And, um, the humour, which is kind of cringe comedy, but with heart, it's uh, it's stunning. So yeah, we'd love that. Anyone uh, brave enough to ask a question yet? <laughs> there. Yes, there's someone there. Over there. Um, as, as, producers, um, as producers, do you tend to deal more with people who are presenting projects as part of a company venture, or would you deal with individuals just as regularly? That's a great question, and one I was supposed to ask. So yeah, <laughs> just, just in case uh, anybody didn't hear that, it, can you come as a, in, an individual, or do you need to be uh, associated with a Prodco? Cheryl. Um, it, it, the BBC, because we're really officious, um, you're meant to go through this system called Pitch, and there's many bodies littered around the UK of people who've tried to put kind of <laughs> projects on Pitch and, and died in the process. But um, <laughs> that's the official way. It, in truth, we get, we get projects in a number of different ways. Jackie's your best bet. Buy her a large gin and tonic, um, <laughs> if not five. And me, actually, while I'm here. Um, and, 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 and truth be told, a guy came up to me two years ago with a script and said, I know you like comedy. I've written this sketch show. Please, will you read it? 
I read it that night because I'm a sucker for scripts. I love comedy scripts. And um, a year later, he had a series called Class Dismissed on the channel. So that guy just approached me with a script and, and he got on the channel. So in truth, there's a few ways, but the official way, Jackie. We'll say Jackie. 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 Jackie and gin and uh, <laughs> Sheila? We're very similar. I mean, there's a, a website that you can put your submission through. Um, but in truth, it's Pauline. She's not here. Pauline McNamara is it's the person. No so if you meet her, or, or people send in a page, and, and we send feedback. It is very Normally, if you're to take it to the next stage, and if it's somebody very inexperienced, we will suggest that you team up with a production company, because I suppose we are spending public money and, and it, we don't have internal resources at the moment to make stuff. So from our point of view, you know, it's, it's useful. If the, if the conversation is to go further, it's useful that it actually comes with a bit of experience behind it, because we're investing quite a lot of money in it. For Amazon, you can come as an individual. Um, you know, if and when the time is right, we would team you with a production company or an animation studio. We want to always make sure that those marriages um, are well thought out and collaborative. Um, but the other thing I would say is sometimes if you don't find the right production company, it could dilute your idea. So we are, again, looking for um, creators' point of view. You know, always I think the best projects for me are the ones that come from a personal space. And so you know them best. You don't necessarily need to be reliant on a production company to execute pitch pages or initial concepting. Sarah. So I was lucky. I used to make stuff at the BBC, and the Channel 5 role is much more to do with commissioning and commissioning companies. But having said that, we also actually don't have that much money, so I'm determined to maximise the benefits. And again, we will also take ideas, I think, from individuals and then try and match them with sympathetic partners because I've been in production for so long, I would like to hope I know who the right people might be and who the, who the, where the right synergies might be. So for now, four months into the job, I'd, I'd love to see everything. Great. Um, sorry, I think we have to leave it there, but I just wanted to thank all of our panelists for uh, making this so much fun. Thank you. Thank you.